Uh, hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to see you all again. We're very happy to be here today in this session of our seminar series topics in early modern studies. As usual, before I introduce our speaker, I would first like to give you the house rules. Please keep your microphones muted during the entire talk. After the presentation, we'll have time for questions. I would also ask you to either write your questions in the chat or use the raise hand function to let us know that you'd like to speak, whichever you feel most comfortable with. When writing in the chat, please feel free to make your questions in English, Portuguese, Spanish or French. Finally, I would also like to remind you that this session is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel later on. Having that said, we're happy to welcome today Dr. Michael Bennett, which will be presenting the paper English Merchants, the Brazilian Sugar Trade and the Rise of the Caribbean Plantation Economies, 1620 to 1680. Dr. Bennett completed his BA at King's College London, his master's at the University of Kent, and his PhD at the University of Sheffield in 2020. During his PhD, he investigated the merchants of the City of London, who financed the expansion of, the, of plantation slave, slavery on Barbados in the mid-17th century. And his thesis is titled Merchant Capital and the Origins of the Barbados Sugar Boom, 1620 to 1671. He is currently a teaching assistant at the University of Sheffield and has been awarded a Society of Renaissance Studies postdoctoral fellowship. He is the author of Slaves, Weavers and the Peopling of English East, East India Company Colonies, 1660 to 1739, a chapter in Richard B. Aylin's forthcoming book, Slavery and Forced Labor in Asia. So thank you very much, Michael, for accepting our invitation and the floor is yours. Of course, Liv, thanks. Thanks very much. I'm just going to um, share my presentation. Now, hopefully that's visible. Um, can you just give me a thumbs up, Liv? Yeah, okay, great. Um, Okay, so yeah, first, let me uh, extend a really big thanks to Liv and Veronica for uh, inviting me to talk as part of the seminar series. Um, I've been really enjoying the presentations so far, which have resulted in some really stimulating discussions. Um, and I hope that we can have an equally interesting conversation today. Um, my plan is to talk for just under 45 minutes, um, which should leave plenty of time for questions afterwards. Um, so a bit of background about my presentation this afternoon. Um, Last year, I finished my PhD at Sheffield, as Liv mentioned, uh, and my thesis was uh, an in-depth study of the English merchants who financed the development of sugar plantations and slavery on the Caribbean island of Barbados during the 1640s and 1650s. I'm currently working on turning this research into a book and a couple of articles, along with a load of other stuff that I'm doing at the moment. Um, but what I'm going to be presenting today is a small article project that I've been working on um, on the side that's very much a spin off from my main research at the moment on merchants and Barbados. Um, so my topic this afternoon is the English merchants who traded to both Brazil and Barbados in the middle decades of the 17th century. Um, and I first became interested in these merchants back when I was finishing up my undergraduate studies at King's College London in 2014, um, when Toby Green, the historian of Lusophone West Africa, encouraged me to carry out research in the Portugal State Papers at the National Archives in Kew. Um, despite the English merchants uh, with Brazil not forming the main focus of my current research, uh, I deliberately chose to present on this topic today when invited um, by Liv a few months ago because I thought it would be really interesting for the audience of this seminar series in particular. Um, because the seminar series does something um, really great, I think, by bringing together scholars of early modern England, uh, early America and early modern Brazil into close conversation. Um, so the first half of my paper will provide a very broad overview of the um, dimensions of English trade to Brazil between roughly the late 16th and uh, century and the 1660s. Um, and the second section will recover the importance of the English merchants trading to Brazil to the rise of the Barbadian sugar economy by focusing in particular on the Bushel Merchant Syndicate. My overall argument is that beginning in the 1640s, English merchants became really key players in the carrying trade of the Portuguese Atlantic, and especially in the Brazilian sugar trade. <clears throat> the importance of English capital in the Brazil Company, founded 1649, and the commercial privileges secured through the Anglo-Portuguese Treaty of 1654, further reinforced the commercial influence of English merchants within the Portuguese Atlantic system. <clears throat> 
English merchants who traded with Brazil were the sugar experts in London during the 1640s. And it should therefore come as no surprise, therefore, that they quickly integrated Barbados into their commercial networks following the emergence of a sugar industry there in around 1643, dispatching factors to the island and even investing directly in Barbadian sugar plantations. Their experience of trading within Portugal's Atlantic system, and especially their involvement in the sugar trade, uh, assisted the swift rise of the Barbadian sugar economy in the 1640s and 1650s. And this is because merchants with prior experience in the Brazilian sugar trade brought with them to Barbados organizational skills, expertise in the transportation of sugar, uh, and useful trading contacts on the continent. I also want to argue that contingent circumstances during the 1640s, an incredibly tumultuous decade throughout the Atlantic world, uh, was fundamental to the rapidity with which Barbados emerged as a leading sugar producer. London merchants were encouraged to invest heavily in plantations and enslaved Africans on Barbados in the 1640s due to the domestic uncertainty associated with the War of the Three Kingdoms uh, and also the opportunity to profit from the spike in sugar prices uh, in European markets resulting from the precipitous decline in the Brazilian sugar industry in the same decade. Um, now, a couple of other things before I begin. Um, what I'm presenting today are very much preliminary thoughts on this topic, uh, and I plan to do some extra research on this over the summer, um, now that we're allowed access to the National Archives in queue in a limited fashion. I'm also really keen to learn from those in the audience um, who are also studying the interactions between the English Atlantic and Brazil and the Iberian Atlantic, um, as I think that this will really help me as I move towards uh, the submission of some of the ideas explored here as a journal article, uh, probably to a venue such as Itinerario. Um, and any recommendations of primary and secondary material to read would be uh, very welcome. Um, a note on sources too. So uh, the main sources I'm using uh, today are going to be from the Portugal State Papers at the National Archives, uh, the Furlough State Papers from the 1650s, um, records of court cases heard in the High Court of Admiralty, the Chancery Court uh, and the Mayor's Court of London, um, and also deeds, mortgages and wills uh, held at the Barbados Department of Archives. I've also used printed material where appropriate too. Um, port, bu port books um, for London and the outports that record imports and exports of commodities don't survive well from my main period of interest, which is the 1640s and 50s. So I haven't drawn uh, heavily upon them for this particular piece of uh, research as it currently stands. Uh, but I do plan to do some research in these records for the 1630s and 1660s uh, over the summer. Um, and uh, for full disclosure from the outset as well, um, perhaps the most glaring shortcoming of this piece of work in its current form is my limited engagement with Portuguese language sources. Um, as you might expect, this is due to my limited knowledge of Portuguese, which results partly from the British education system's woeful uh, modern, modern foreign language provision in the 2000s. Um, but blame lies mostly with myself, uh, I think, for not yet getting my act together and, and um, getting uh, reading proficiency in Portuguese, because uh, I think in the age of apps like Duolingo and freely available online um, resources, uh, language learning resources, there's no excuse for scholars like myself not to make at least some effort to attain basic reading ability in various languages relevant to our research. And this is something that uh, I'm keen to work on moving forwards uh, in my career. But despite the limitations of my uh, language proficiency, I have tried to engage where possible with and cite Portuguese language scholarship. Uh, and I hope that my Brazilian and Portuguese colleagues here today will be sympathetic with one of the broad points I'm trying to make in this paper, uh, which is that scholars of early modern England and the English colonies in North America and the Caribbean have a lot to learn from the history of the Portuguese Atlantic world uh, and should be uh, engaging more fully with this history in their own work. Um, what happened in the Iberian Atlantic and Brazil in particular uh, is not just useful context for the study of the English Atlantic, but is uh, integral to understanding how and why it developed as it did. As the 2018 edited collection by uh, George Canizares Esquera powerfully demonstrates, the English and Iberian empires were thoroughly uh, entangled in the early modern period. Uh, and part of what I'm trying to do today is to use the case study of English merchants, the Brazil trade and the development of the Barbadian plantation economy to highlight this point. Okay, so um, Brazil was uh, discovered uh, and colonized um, by the Portuguese in the early 16th century. Um, expertise in the cultivation and processing of sugar was brought to Brazil from Madeira and the Canary Islands. And by the 1530s, a commercial sugar industry was beginning to flourish there. By the 1570s, the uh, engenhos or sugar mills uh, were largely concentrated in the rich alluvial captaincies of northern Brazil, Bahia and Pernambuco. Uh, 
Brazilian sugar dominated the European market from the 1570s until the middle decades of the 17th century, when there was a rise in competition from new sugar producers in Caribbean islands such as Barbados. Merchants in the southwest ports of England, such as Plymouth and Southampton, uh, were the pioneers of English trade and exploration in Brazil and were attracted by lucrative commodities such as sugar and Brazilwood. Now, Brazilwood was uh, processed and used as a red dye for England's main export uh, cloth in this period. Uh, indeed, Kenneth Andrews suggests that there was a, quote, considerable Brazil trade from 1530 to 1542. And one example is the voyage um, of William Hawkins in the pool from Plymouth uh, to Guinea and then on to Brazil, which yielded a cargo of ivory and 92 tons of Brazilwood. These were mostly illicit trading ventures, which um, without the sanction of Portuguese authorities, who under the Treaty of Tordesillas of 1494 claimed a monopoly over Brazilian commerce. After 1542, English participation in the Brazil trade dropped off considerably before picking up again in the 1570s. The union of the Spanish and Portuguese crowns in 1580 and the Anglo-Spanish War from 1585 to 1604 uh, meant that ships trading in Brazilian sugar were fair game for English privateers infesting the Atlantic. And it's estimated that around 34 Brazil vessels were captured by the English in the three years from 1589 to 91 alone. The influx of Brazilian sugar taken as prize into England stimulated the expansion of the sugar refining uh, industry in London. Uh, Thomas Middleton, for example, maintained a sugar refinery in Mincing Lane between 1585 and 1592. So English trade with Brazil had become a regular occurrence by the 1620s and 1630s. As Stuart Swartz estimates that by the 1630s, as much as 80% of the sugar sold in London was grown in Brazil with the rest presumably coming from the East Indies and the Barbary coast in North Africa. While merchants based in the English outports uh, of the south and southwest of England pioneered English voyages to Brazil in the 16th century, by the 1630s it was merchants in the city of London who were providing um, most of the capital and energy behind this commerce um, in collaboration with commercial contacts in the Low Countries and Lisbon. Notable London merchants who were involved in the trade to Brazil during the 1630s and early 1640s included William Byrd, Edward Bushell, Sir William Courtine, Richard Cranley, Nicholas Crisp, Thomas Kendall, Luke Lucy, Humphrey Slaney, Richard Shute, Samuel Vassell and Roger Vivian. A decade later in the 1650s, all but one of these merchants also had a vested interest um, uh, in the production and trade of, in sugar from Barbados. Uh, the outlier is William Byrd. Some of these merchants developed a commercial interest in Brazilian sugar as a result of their participation in Iberian trade. English merchants resident in Lisbon with contacts in London and throughout the Portuguese Atlantic were given permission to trade with Brazil on their own account so long as they paid customs dues in Portugal. Take Edward Bushell, for example, someone who you're going to become quite familiar with during this talk. She was an Englishman who by the 1660s had become a prolific London merchant involved in both Portuguese Atlantic trade and the Barbadian sugar economy. He was born around the year 1620. Nice details uh, about the origins of his business career do not survive, but it seems that he served his apprenticeship within the small English merchant community at Lisbon in the 1630s and early 1640s. We can infer this from a deposition in the High Court of Admiralty from 1651, where Bushel explains that, quote, when he lived at Lisbon, he did himself trade to Brasilia, and since he had continually traded there for these seven or eight years by his factors. It suggests that he was resident in Lisbon in the 1630s, uh, and in either 1643 or 1644, he relocated from Lisbon to London, but nonetheless still maintained a close relationship with merchants and factors in Portugal through whom he traded to through whom he traded, excuse me, to Brazil. Bushel was certainly in London by January 1644, when he appeared in the Mayor's Court of London to lodge a complaint on behalf of Richard Beer an English merchant resident in Lisbon who was owed a large debt from John Lynn, another English merchant who was based in Porto. Brazilian sugar was the primary focus of the Bushel trading syndicate. In 1651, for example, two vessels owned by Edward and John Bushel, the Lady Conception and the St. Anthony, were carrying 29 chests of Brazilian sugar when they were captured by a Dutch warship. Other English merchants who developed commercial ties with Brazil through Portuguese trade include Thomas Kendall, uh, who was resident in Lisbon in 1638 and heavily involved in the Brazil trade. Some London merchants, uh, however, developed uh, a commercial relationship with Brazil during the 1630s and early 1640s, not through Iberian trade, but through their Anglo-Dutch links. What Wim Kluster has recently described as the Dutch moment, 
in Atlantic history began in the 1620s, when the Dutch expanded overseas suddenly and powerfully, carving out an Atlantic empire in South America and West Africa at the expense of the Portuguese. The Dutch briefly occupied Salvador de Bahia from 1624 to 25, but after 1630 began the systematic conquest of Brazil under the aegis of the West India Company, starting with the rich sugar producing captaincies of Bahia and Pernambuco, before gradually extending their control further along the coast. Uh, equally as important in my mind was the capture of Portugal's West African trading factories, Elmina Castle on the Gold Coast in 1637 and the island of Sao Tome and, Lu and Luanda in Angola in 1641. This allowed the Dutch to control the lion's share of the lucrative gold and ivory trade and also to support their sugar producing colonies in Brazil with enslaved African labourers. Merchants in London with existing family and business partnerships in the Netherlands uh, developed a firm commercial interest in Brazil uh, following the Dutch conquest. A good example is uh, Sir William Courtine, an Anglo-Dutch merchant who was apprenticed in Harlem and who in the 1630s maintained a far-flung business empire in the Atlantic and Indian Ocean worlds, within which regions of Dutch settlement and occupation in South America, such as Guyana and Brazil, were key nodes. Sephardic Jewish merchants who've been studied by scholars like Kachan Chunes and Ida Schroeder also had extensive familial and business networks which span the Netherlands, London, Lisbon and across the Atlantic world. And they were another group with representatives in London who had uh, important trading connections to Brazil. For instance, Luke Lucy, uh, who's sometimes known as Lucas Lucy in the uh, records, uh, was a London merchant who came from a cosmopolitan family of Sephardic businessmen with mercantile ties across the Atlantic world, including Brazil and Barbados in the mid 17th century. It was a marked increase uh, in the volume of English shipping involved in Brazilian commerce in the 1640s. This was due to two events, the split between the Portuguese and Spanish crown in 1640, which sparked the Portuguese Restoration War, um, and the revolt of planters in Pernambuco against their Dutch overlords uh, beginning in earnest in June 1645. There was money to be made for English merchants by hiring out their ships to the Portuguese state to help it prosecute its ongoing wars against the Spanish and against the Dutch in Brazil, and also new commercial opportunities for, it to, for English merchants resident in Lisbon and their business partners in London, who recorded privileges in Portuguese trade by King Jao IV in 1642. Despite high customs duties levied by the Portuguese crown on foreign merchants, and importing and exporting goods. Uh, there was a 10% exports duty that had to be paid at Bahia or Rio, uh, another 23% import duty at Lisbon, and a final 3% before the sugar could be re-exported to England, which, which adds up. Um, despite all this, English merchants such as uh, Bushel weren't deterred, which speaks, uh, I think, to the profitability of the trade in Brazilian sugar in the 1640s. There were 20 English vessels involved in the Brazil trade from 1648 to 49, including at least of one of Edward Bushel's ships, the Roebuck, which was seized by Prince Rupert at the Targis Estuary in 1649. Formation of the Compania do Brazil, Brazil Company, in 1649 changed the dynamics of English trade to Brazil. The Brazil Company was founded to help finance the development of the Brazilian fleet, as Portugal's warships and merchant marine had been badly depleted by years of war with the Dutch. Sea power in the Atlantic was recognised as the key to repelling Dutch efforts to reconquer Brazil and also to help protect the sugar convoys between Brazil and Lisbon. The supply of sugar was really important because customs duties from Brazilian sugar were fundamental to financing the Portuguese army's war of independence against Spain. The Brazil company had a monopoly over the trade in flour, cod, oil and wine with the colony. New Christians and foreign merchants could, however, become shareholders of the company with a minimum subscription of 20 cruzados. And as Leonor Frere Costa has shown, English merchants with business links in Lisbon were significant investors in the company um, and were given licenses to continue trading with Brazil. Although a comprehensive list of investors in the Brazil company doesn't appear to have survived, although if anyone here has knowledge to the contrary, I'd be super interested in hearing it. Um, we do know that English merchants like Edward Bush and William Byrd both invested in the Brazil company and were prominent members. In 1661, uh, they acted as substitute agents for the company in London, prosecuting the owners of four English ships that had traded directly to Brazil for sugar and Brazil wood and had returned to London without first stopping off in Lisbon to pay the required customs duties. Through their investments in the Brazil company and willingness to hire out merchant shipping to the Portuguese in the late 1640s, English merchants managed to capture a sizable share of the carrying trade in Brazilian sugar. They also helped to finance the successful rebellion of Portuguese planters against the Dutch in Brazil. 
as the historian Toby Green notes, and I quote, Portugal's victory in Brazil depended on English finance and the development of the Brazilian fleet. Important to highlight here, I think, is that it's, it was English merchants pursuing private profit, not the English state, who were instrumental in facilitating the expansion of Anglo-Brazilian trade in the 1640s. The case of English merchants and Brazil thus broadly supports L.H. Roper's argument that it was merchants and colonists pursuing their private interests that facilitated the expansion of the English empire and trade in the 17th century. In fact, in this particular case, rather than assisting English merchants in their effort to enlarge trading profits, uh, the, common, the Commonwealth government and the aftermath of the Civil War uh, was actually frustrating the efforts of English merchants in London and Lisbon to profit from commercial opportunities presented by the crisis in Portugal and Brazil. Prince Rupert fled to Lisbon in October 1649, and the efforts of the Commonwealth government to bring him to heel in 1650 resulted in naval engagements and a blockade of the Targus estuary. This led to the confiscation of the property of English merchants in Lisbon and an undeclared war between England and Portugal from 1650 to 52, which severely hurt England's Brazil trade for a brief period. Nonetheless, it's clear that the use of English shipping and the influence of English merchants within the Portuguese Atlantic system was deepening in the 1640s and 1650s, as evidenced uh, by the sugar and slave trading network of Edward Bushel, which had an impressive range spanning Madeira, the Azores, Cape Verde, Brazil and Angola. Bushel's trading business was coordinated through a factor base in Lisbon, John Bushel, who was also his brother. He won. Uh, Edward Bushel deposed in a High Court of Admiralty suit, explaining how, I quote, the interrogated John Bushel, his this deponent's brother living at Lisbon, hath for several years last past managed and driven a considerable trade thence to the Brazilla and the coast of Angola, and have frequently sugars and other merchandises laden for his accompt upon diverse ships trading for those parts, which he knoweth having interest with him in several of those voyages, and hath often and frequent advice from him concerning his said dealings there and returns thence. But working through his brother in Lisbon, Edward Bushel developed a, a profitable shipping business and drove a trade in sugar within the Portuguese empire from his base of operations in the city of London. Uh, between August 1648 and February 1649, for instance, John Bushel hired a 240-ton vessel, the Green Lion, for a venture to the Azores to lade sugar and precious woods, uh, which was subsequently sent to his brother Edward and father Thomas in London. Portuguese subjects often hired English ships to transport their merchandise to and from West Africa and Brazil. Yeah, the governor of Angola, uh, João Fernandes Vieira, employed one of Bushel's vessels called the Brazil Frigate for a voyage for Luan from Luanda to Pernambuco with a cargo of 1,200 enslaved Africans and 22,000 pounds of ivory. In 1659, Simon Rodriguez Chavez and Diego de Chavez freighted bushel ship the Hope, which picked up 136 chests of Brazilian sugar at the Azores, but was captured by Turkish pirates while en route to Venice and taken into Algiers as a prize. But by the 1650s, a sizable share of the trade in Brazilian sugar was being captured by English merchants like the bushels. The commercial privileges secured through the Anglo-Portuguese Treaty of 1654, um, signed by Cromwell in close consultation with Bushel and other Portugal merchants, and the cordial diplomatic relations that followed the marriage of Charles II and Catherine of Baganza in 1661 further reinforced the influence of English merchants in the Portuguese Atlantic system. It wouldn't be too much of an exaggeration to argue, as the historian of Atlantic slavery Robin Blackburn does, that after the 1650s, and I quote, privileged merchants were installed at the very heart of the Portuguese colonial enterprise. So um, you may well now uh, be thinking, what relevance does any of this have, the, the growing commercial influence of English merchants within the Portuguese Atlantic Empire after the period um, uh, in the, of the 1640s have for the history of English settlement in the Caribbean and Barbados specifically? Well, the answer, I think, is twofold. Um, when carrying out my research on the English merchants who helped to finance and supply the Barbadian plantation economy, I was struck by two things. First, uh, how there was crossover in the English merchants trading to Brazil and those who invested in the Barbadian plantation economy. English merchants trading to Brazil and those who invested in the Barbadian um, uh, plantation economy um, uh, were, were really significant. Uh, English traders with Brazilian connections helped to finance the initial settlement um, of Barbados in 1627. I'm talking about Sir William Cortine here. Um, they were also involved in shipping the first recorded contingent of enslaved Africans to Barbados in 1641, Sir Nicholas Crisp. Um, and in the case of individuals like Luke Lucy, Thomas Kendall and Edward Bushell, 
their expertise in the sugar trade with Brazil helped not only to facilitate their own success as prominent Barbadian uh, traders, but also assisted the rise of the Barbadian sugar economy in the middle decades of the 17th century. Second, um, I became aware of how the wider context of what was happening in Brazil shaped the economic development of Barbados. Historical contingencies unique to the 1640s, including the precipitous decline in the Brazilian sugar industry, drove merchant investment into Barbados. Events in Brazil were thus fundamental to the rapidity with which Barbados developed a mature plantation economy based around sugar production. What remains of my presentation, I'm going to talk about these two topics in turn. So commercial sugar production began in Barbados as early as 1643. Historians have long known connections between Barbados and sugar producing regions of northern Brazil facilitated the dissemination of useful knowledge about sugar production to Barbadian planters, stimulating the development of the island's own sugar industry. In an excellent article published in History and Technology in 2012, Erika Tremba has persuasively demonstrated how it was Barbadian planters with Anglo-Dutch connections, um, such as James Drax, uh, and those with Sephardic backgrounds, um, such as Constance Sylvester and Luke Lucy, um, who pioneered sugar production in Barbados because of the access they had to expert knowledge from Brazil about how to run a successful sugar plantation. Richard Ligon, uh, a royalist exile who recorded his experiences on Barbados between 1647 and 1650 in his true and exact history of Barbados, described this process of knowledge transfer um, when he explained how some of the, quote, some of the most industrious men, having gotten plants from Pernambuco, decided to make trial of them at the Barbados. The process of trial and error, along with uh, new directions from Brazil, English planters were able to quickly improve the quality and quantity of their yields. Ligon explained that sometimes this process of knowledge exchange and technology transfer between Brazil and Barbados was facilitated by Englishmen who travelled to Brazil themselves seeking the quote secrets of that mystery uh, and who returned with plants and better knowledge. While at other occasions um, it was um, uh, strangers uh, from the mainland who settled on the island. Um, it's likely these strangers were Sephardic refugees who fled the Caribbean islands following the escalating conflict between the Dutch and Portuguese in northern Brazil and had experience in the sugar economy. And it's also worth mentioning that it's been plausibly argued by Russell Maynard that the, quote, Portugal Negroes uh, described as labouring on James Drax's plantation may have been Afro-Brazilians uh, who were purchased specifically because of the pre-existing knowledge they had in how to raise a bountiful sugar crop and process the cane. So uh, where did the English merchants with trading interests in Brazil during the 1630s and 1640s that I discussed earlier in the paper fit into this story of knowledge transfer to Barbados? Historians of uh, the early modern Caribbean have tended to focus on Dutch Brazil and, and Anglo-Dutch connections when exploring the origins of sugar production in Barbados, leaving the potential importance of English traders with Lisbon and Brazil understudied and underexplored. So for starters, London-based merchants and their family members who were involved in the Brazilian sugar trade were some of the most significant investors in Barbadian sugar plantations during the sugar boom of the 1640s. Traders with Brazil, such as Luke Lucy and Thomas Kendall, first purchased, um, uh, excuse me, speculated heavily in Barbadian land and invested directly in Barbadian sugar production. Lucy, for example, first purchased land in Barbados in 1645 and by 1658 had aggregated enough surrounding land to expand his plantation to a very sizable 700 acres. Um, Thomas Kendall, on the other hand, acquired a half share in the 500 acre Buckland plantation in January 1647 in partnership with his brother-in-law Thomas Modiford. Merchants with direct experience uh, in the Brazilian sugar trade thus invested in the production of sugar in Barbados in the year of the sugar boom and their knowledge possibly helped to, to stimulate the growth of the Barbadian industry. Um, but I actually think that the main significance of the English merchants trading to Brazil to the history of Barbados was not their knowledge of sugar production per se, but rather their expertise in the commercial side of the Atlantic sugar trade. In the 1640s, when sugar production first began, in Barbados, the only English merchants in London who were true sugar specialists were those who traded with Portugal and Brazil. In fact, lots of the London merchants who invested in Barbadian sugar production in the 1640s had no direct experience in the sugar trade. Morris Thompson, William Penoyer, Richard Bates and Anthony Hooper and others were all primarily American tobacco traders uh, and um, some of them were traders with West Africa as well. 
while uh, Andrew Rickard, William Williams and Edwin Brown were East India and Levant traders. The most extreme uh, example is Martin Knoll, who began his career as a scrivener um, in London and has no recorded involvement at all in overseas commerce before his investment in a total of 845.5 acres on Barbados between March 1646 and November 1647. Um, so therefore, in the early years of sugar production in Barbados, most London merchants who invested in the Barbadian economy lacked the relevant knowledge and business contacts needed to efficiently transport and sell sugar in European markets. Um, one group who didn't lack expertise in the Atlantic sugar trade were English merchants involved in Brazilian commerce during the 1630s and 40s. And these merchants had a distinct commercial advantage, therefore, in the early Barbadian sugar trade, because they already knew the most efficient methods for packing sugar into casks and chests, um, possessed useful business contacts among sugar refiners in England, uh, and merchants in Lisbon, Hamburg, and Amsterdam who knew the best markets to sell sugar. Merchants with experience in both the Brazilian and Barbados sugar trades were therefore recognized experts in London. Uh, Luke Lucy and Thomas Kendall, for example, were both called upon to impart their expertise on the sugar trade and Barbadian affairs to the English state uh, in February 1656 during a meeting at Grocers Hall in London to discuss, quote, the preserving of the trade of this nation, securing of merchant ships and goods. So merchants with experience in the Brazil trade, such as Thomas Kendall, Luke Lucy and Edward Bushell, quickly emerged as some of the most successful sugar traders with Barbados and integrated the island into their existing commercial networks within the Portuguese empire. Perhaps the best example of this is Edward Bushell. His business ties with Barbados can be traced to the onset of the sugar boom in the 1640s. His kinsman, Thomas Bushell, served as his factor on the island during the 1650s. And another possible relation, Ferdinando Bushell, was also living on Barbados at this time, but it's unclear whether he was involved in the family business. Although Thomas Bushell owned land and property on Barbados as early as 1647, the Bushell Merchant Syndicate didn't uh, speculate heavily in the production of sugar. Instead, they took advantage of the commercial dynamism on the island by setting up shop in Bridgetown, um, the leading port city in Barbados, uh, and in the process became heavily involved in the marketing of sugar and the shipping industry. In a 1663 petition to the Privy Council, Edward Bushell detailed how he had, I quote, out of mere charity and compassion taken into his service and employment of one Thomas Bushell, a poor kinsman of his, to do him good for his better encouragement and advancement, sent him some years past beyond the seas and settled him in the Barbados, entrusting him as uh, the petitioner's servant and factor with considerable cargoes of goods and sums of money, and thereby at present hath in his hand and possession a great part of the petitioner's estate to the value of seven or eight thousand pounds sterling. Edward Bushell's commercial involvement with Barbados became more pronounced in the 1650s and early 1660s. Bushell's claim in a 1663 petition that uh, in late years he hath had a considerable trade to the said plantation, Barbados, both in stock and shipping, is supported by documentation from the colonial office records. For example, he assisted and profited from uh, the English Commonwealth's efforts to suppress royalist uprisings in the colonies. Uh, the Brazil frigate, one of Edward Bushell's ships, was part of the fleet commanded by Sir George Ayscue sent to reduce Barbados in 1652. Bushell also fitted out his ship, the Amity, with provisions, passengers and servants to be transported to Barbados in April 1668. The intensification of Bushell's business ties with Barbados in the 1650s and 1660s can be interpreted as resulting both from the passage of the English Navigation Acts, uh, which place preferential duties on English grown sugar from places like Barbados as opposed to foreign grown sugar uh, like that from Brazil. And also the natural progression of his business career as, as Bushell was now a mature businessman in his late 30s and early 40s and thus had a larger stock of trading capital and a more extensive network of overseas contacts. Um, the diarist Samuel Pepys uh, in London writing in 1664 marveled at Bushell's business of sugars. Following its conquest in 1655, Jamaica was also integrated into Edward Bushell's trading network and quickly became an important part of his business operations. Uh, Edward's keen interest in Jamaica may have developed because his kinsman and Barbados factor Thomas Bushell was a lieutenant colonel uh, in the English force which seized the island from the Spanish in 1655. Thomas subsequently owned land on the island, um, presumably as a reward for his service in the Western design. By 1660, both Edward Bushell and his partner in London and in the Brazil trade, William Byrd, were dispatching their vessels to trade at Jamaica. Indeed, Bushell's Caribbean trading ventures were being combined with his existing commerce in Portugal and her overseas colonies. 
example, the master of his ship, um, the Francis and Richard was instructed in 1660 to procure a lady at Madeira, <clears throat> travel to Jamaica and discharge her goods before returning to either London or Lisbon. So that's how merchants such as Busher were developing multilateral trading networks that bound together the English and Portuguese empires. Other members of the Bushel Merchant Syndicate became some of the most important and prosperous sugar traders living in the port town of Bridgetown in Barbados during the middle decades of the 17th century. John Bushel, the brother of London-based sugar trader Edward, was dispatched to Barbados to manage the family's sugar trading business there as a factor after the death of their kinsman Thomas in the early 1660s. If we cast our mind back to earlier in my paper, it will be remembered that John Bushell had previously served in the 1640s as Edward's factor in Lisbon, uh, trading from there to Brazil and Angola, which afforded him with the extensive contacts in the Portuguese Atlantic world, useful for his uh, Barbadian sugar business. Operating in partnership with Francis Bond, John Bushell became one of uh, Bridgetown's leading merchants over the course of the 1660s and 1670s. Surviving deed records at the Barbados Department of Archives reveal how um, uh, over the course of the 1660s and 1670s, Bushel and Bond purchased real estate in Bridgetown, uh, including a house and storehouse in the desirable Cheapside neighborhood, uh, along also with a contingent of 79 enslaved Africans. As well as accumulating Barbadian property, Bushel and Bond were deeply involved in regional trade in the Caribbean. They were part owners and freighters of the William and Nicholas, uh, for instance, which in February 1670 was undertaking a trading mission in the Greater Caribbean for logwood when the ship became leaky and was forced to put in at Anguilla for repairs. Bushel and Bond even published a pamphlet in 1668 detailing the devastating impact of a fire in the commercial district of Bridgetown, which was of interest to the reading public in England because it came two years after a similar fire had levelled London. So in the brief um, final part of my talk, I'm going to move away from discussing the specifics of the commercial networks of English traders with Brazil and Barbados to a discussion of the broader significance of events in Brazil to the emergence of the sugar industry in Barbados during the 1640s. Um, in his important book, Sweet Negotiations, Russell Maynard has shown how heavy investment from absentee London merchants, along with some reinvestments of capital from local sources, paid for the machinery and enslaved Africans needed to kickstart sugar production in Barbados during the 1640s. When compared to other colonies in the Caribbean, the emergence of a plantation economy based around sugar production was particularly rapid in Barbados, developing in around 10 to 15 years. Now, by contrast, it wasn't until the 1680s or the earliest that a sugar industry had fully urged a mature sugar industry uh, in English colonies such as St. Kitts and Jamaica, uh, around 40 years after Barbados. And this has led historians to speak um, with some good reason, I think, uh, of a sugar boom or sugar revolution occurring in Barbados during the 1640s and 50s. But the reasons for this discrepancy um, uh, between Barbados and elsewhere in the Caribbean were in part geographic and environmental. Uh, Barbados is one of the closest Caribbean islands to northern Brazil and thus had easier access to expert knowledge in sugar production uh, and was also close to the sources of slave supply in West Africa. Furthermore, when compared uh, to uh, other Caribbean islands such as Jamaica, the remote geographical location of Barbados made it less prone to Spanish attacks uh, and less at risk from the destructive impact of natural disasters such as hurricanes and earthquakes. Um, these are factors which could easily stifle the development of a nascent sugar industry as, as they did several times during the 17th century in islands such as St. Kitts. But I also think there's something to be said for the importance of timing uh, and specifically contingent historical events unique to the 1640s um, to the speed with which Barbados turned to sugar production and African slavery in that decade. Um, and this is because tumultuous events both in Brazil and England uh, influenced the decision of London merchants to invest heavily in Barbados. And it's this direct investment which is one of the keys to explaining why the development of sugar plantations and slavery in Barbados was so rapid when compared to elsewhere in the Caribbean. The wider context of warfare between the Dutch and Portuguese in northern Brazil during the 1640s and early 1650s and the devastating impact this had uh, on the Atlantic sugar economy underpinned the rise in other highly profitable sugar industries in the English and French Caribbean. The opportunity to capitalise upon the elevation in sugar prices and the disorder in Brazil generated by developing a new source of supply in Barbados um, uh, motivated London merchants to become deeply involved with the Barbadian economy in the mid 17th century. So the disturbance to the Atlantic sugar economy was caused by the combined impact of the interruption to sugar production in Bayer and Pernambuco and the harm 
which Dutch privateers caused the maritime commerce with Brazil. Both the invaders and the resistors destroyed Engenios and um, burned cane fields, rendering around one third of the mills in the region out of operation by 1639. And to compound these issues further, a high proportion of the Portuguese vessels engaged in the Brazil trade were captured by Dutch privateers, with approximately 220 merchant caravels being taken in the two years from 1647 to 48. And it's been estimated, therefore, that the tumult in Bahia and Pernambuco um, caused annual sugar exports from Brazil to contract from a high of around 14,900 crates um, of sugar in 1641, to approximately 1,500 crates every year in the period between 1647 and 1652, a very significant drop-off. And the precipitous decline in sugar exports from Brazil to Europe presented an excellent opportunity, therefore, for those willing to enter the market and develop a new source of sugar production in the Caribbean or elsewhere. And Samuel Hartlib, um, the Anglo-German intellectual living in England, captured the commercial situation perfectly when he stated in 1649 that because of the, quote, mills being destroyed in Brazil, the sugar trade in Barbados prospers the more. So the, the disruption to the Brazilian sugar economy and the promise of massive profits from the production and marketing of sugar, uh, of Barbadian sugar, was the pull factor uh, that enticed London merchants to invest directly in the Barbadian economy during the 1640s. But there were also push factors too on the English side, which are worth mentioning. Um, I can only go into brief detail here, but would be happy to expand during questions. Um, the political and economic uncertainty caused by the War of the Three Kingdoms caused the English merchants to mitigate against increased risk by diversifying their investment portfolios. Usual outlets for investment were no longer particularly secure prospects. Land in England could be sequestered or desolated as a side effect of the war, and investing in the joint stock of trading companies, such as the East India Company, was also increasingly risky due to the uncertainty surrounding corporate charters um, and the threat of royalist privateers. Merchants instead um, invested in the war um, by securing government contracts and tax farming offices, stored their money with goldsmith bankers, uh, and increasingly looked beyond England's shores um, for secure locations to store their assets. London merchants invested heavily in land overseas uh, by participating in the Irish Adventurous Scheme uh, and by directly purchasing plantations on Barbados. London merchants saw Barbados, a Caribbean island whose inhabitants repeatedly professed a neutral stance in the War of the Three Kingdoms between uh, around 1642 and 49, um, which made merchants think that it represented a more secure investment than keeping their capital in war-torn England during the 1640s. At the Barbados Department of Archives, there's evidence for how 64 different English merchants operating either alone or in partnership purchased 5,739 acres of land, um, plantations essentially, on Barbados between 1640 and 50. And 84% of these deeds of sale uh, on Barbados in the 1640s uh, involving English merchants are costed between the years 1643 to 48, precisely the time that the disruption generated by the Civil War was at its height. I want to end now um, by returning to Edward Bushell very briefly, who died in 1693 at the age of 73. Uh, in his will, Edward Bushell specified that he was owed a debt from the King of Portugal, uh, which stands as testament to his enduring influence in Lisbon as a merchant and moneylender. Though he never secured a prominent office within the English government, he was nonetheless one of London's most successful merchants. And over the course of his career, his family business had become an expansive and transnational trading empire, which encompassed both the English and Portuguese Atlantic worlds. Bushell's network uh, was mainly focused upon London and Lisbon, but from these nodes reached out to Madeira, the Azores, Cape Verde, Brazil, Angola, Barbados and Jamaica. Um, and throughout his life, his principal trading interest was in a single commodity, really, sugar. And particularly important for my purposes is that he was involved in both the Brazilian sugar trade and the Barbados sugar boom. Um, the course of Edward Bushell's career, which began with the Brazil trade in the 1630s and after the 1640s and 1650s also encompassed Barbados and Jamaica, reflects the wider process which uh, saw the locus of sugar production in the Atlantic world shift from Brazil to the Caribbean islands over the course of the 17th century. The shift in Bushell's business preferences was being driven partly by the dynamism of the Barbadian sugar economy, uh, but also by the Navigation Acts of 1651 and 60, which uh, placed preferential duties on sugar imported into England from English colonies such as Barbados.
But the experience, knowledge and business contacts that merchants like Bushel brought with them when they first became involved in the Barbadian economy in the 1640s and 1650s enabled them to become some of the most successful Barbadian sugar traders and assisted the rapid rise of Barbados as a leading sugar producer. This highlights more broadly, I think, how the history of mid 17th century Barbados was deeply entangled with that of Brazil and the Portuguese Atlantic world. Um, following the death of men like Bushel at the end of the 17th century, English merchants and businessmen would uh, remain significant players in the Portuguese Atlantic system for decades, uh, even centuries afterwards. Um, the Methuen Treaty of 1703 permitted free trade and exports of English cloth to Brazil, um, uh, to Portugal, excuse me. Um, and after the uh, abolition uh, of slavery in the British Empire in the 1830s, um, British banks and merchants retained a significant financial interest in the slave sugar system in Brazil, uh, where slavery wasn't abolished until 1888. And I would argue that sugar traders like Edward Bushel um, were key players in the process that bound together the English and Portuguese Atlantic worlds, because they forged uh, commercial networks that spanned London, Lisbon, Brazil and Barbados in the 1640s uh, and 1650s. Uh, thanks very much for listening. Thanks, Michael, for such a, an interesting talk. Uh, I'm opening now the floor for for questions. So please, if anyone wants to make a question, please do it by either raising your hand or type it in the chat box. Uh, so first we have Thiago, please. Hi, good afternoon. I'd like to uh, compliment Dr. Bennett. It's a great, was a great presentation. It's something that I've been very interested in the past couple of years and discussed some of the same characters with Lou, with, who is also here. Uh, so I, I'd like to, to, to make a, a brief comparison. Uh, when, you, when you talk about the destroying of, uh, of uh, sugar plantations in Brazil, it was not, not actually all of Brazil. It was mostly Pernambuco, where the war was fought, and Bahia, which is the place uh, uh, where the, which my main object of interest, of course. Uh, but also there was Rio de Janeiro. At the same time as Barbad, uh, Bar Barbados was doubling it, uh, was uh, experiencing its sugar boom, Rio de Janeiro was as well doubling its, uh, its the number mm -hmm. of uh, sugar plantations it had. So what's interesting is that uh, English trade in Barbados was much more dynamic and able to to uh, to fulfill this demand for sugar than Brazil. Rio de Janeiro could uh, try, Rio de Janeiro actually expanded uh, greatly during the, during this decade, but it wasn't enough to fulfill this demand. So it's interesting to see how uh, the difference between the loser Brazilian economy and the Anglo Barbadian economy because. Uh, Barbados could, was able to quick start uh, its production much more quickly mm. and uh, and on a much higher level than Rio de Janeiro, which ha which already had a, a, a sugar a sugar industry for the past I don't know seven, 60, 17 years, but it wasn't uh, it wasn't able to fulfill this uh, this demand. So it shows the the interesting difference between the between Brazilian sugar production, English sugar production, it shows the different levels of dynamics they had. Hmm. Uh, another thing I'd like to point out is that you make a, a kind of, at the end of a presentation, kind of a direct connection between the mid 17th century connection, uh, mid 17th century uh, Barbade, Bra Brazilian Barbadian connection and uh, the Anglo-Brazilian connection up to the 19th century, but I would argue, I would argue that in the late 17th century, as Bar Barbados sugar production rose that high, in fact, the English lost uh, much, in much uh, of their interest in Brazil. In the 1670s, 1680s, uh, 1690s, there was much less uh, I see in, uh, in the source of, uh, I've, I've looked at so far, much less interest, much less English interest in Brazil. Uh, and its connection, its interest was rekindled in the early 18th century by 
by the by go discoveries. And right. that's what actually remained up to the 19th century. Mm-hmm. Bridge interest in Brazil, as the Joe Mullern's uh, PhD dissertation shows, was much more connected to, to mining than actually to sugar. Mm-hmm. Because uh, sugar was basically irrelevant to, to the English market up to 1836. When the at the end of uh, the the end of the corn laws and the and the and the free trade uh, that opened the British market to Brazilian sugar, so I think there's there's a break in the in the late 17th century, but it was soon rekindled by by gold. And Bahia was the crucial uh, place in both of these connections because. In the 1640s and 50s, where most of these English merchants went to Bahia, because Bahia became, after uh, the Dutch invasion of Pernambuco, the, the main sugar, Brazilian sugar exporter. So we can find then the High Court Admiralty. There's there's also the reference to them in the in the Portuguese sources uh, uh, of the Arquivo Histórico da Maria and the Torre do Tombo as well, of, including Bushel. I found, for instance, uh, I even sent it to Lou. Uh, uh, Pusho got a, a, a permission, a special permission to send a ship directly to, to Bahia in the hmm. mid 1650s, something like that. I don't remember the exact date. Oh, fascinating. Uh, and and the, in the early 18th century, again, was Bahia that, that was uh, more closely connected to English traders. Why? Because Bahia, slave traders, traded with the, with the Gold Coast, where English traders uh, were also active. Uh, Leonardo Marques has been working with that, has been working uh, with this with this topic. Uh, also, uh, one last thing. It's th- I'm sorry. This uh, this is uh, one of the moments to say. It's not exactly a, a, a question, but just musings, comments, because uh, your pres- your excellent presentation interests me so much. I hope uh, I hope you publish it quickly so so I can cite it, and read it, and cite it. <laughs> uh, but Thank hey, you. Uh, this. Uh, these connections predate a little bit of 1630. We, mm-hmm. You can find in Simancas some discussions of uh, of English shipping uh, and uh, the, the Spanish were discussing the possibility of using English shipping to uh, in Brazil. They are in the, the Estado section of the Arquivo General de Simancas. Uh, I've seen, I, I managed to copy to ask them one of these documents, but there was one other I have to go there as well because I don't have the exact reference, just the, just the, the legajo. Anyway, I, I, this is, uh, I think it's, there was a previous connection, but then 1630 represented a major break in the Atlantic because of, because of the Portuguese, uh, because of the Portuguese coup d'etat the, the, that allowed uh, the put John IV from the throne. So I, I think your presentation, your future article will, will be extremely enlightening about this crucial moment in, in the in Atlantic history. Mm. So thank you, uh, Dr. Bennett. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, uh, Tiago, for your kind comments. Um, and so I'd just like to um, respond, if that's okay, um, to, to a few of the things and just prompt perhaps a discussion about your first point as well. So um, on, on the point about um, uh, uh, the break in uh, uh, Anglo-Brazilian uh, trade, commerce, the close links between the Portuguese Atlantic and the English Atlantic system in the late 17th century. I think I think you're exactly um, you're exactly right, and um, I, I probably was trying to draw too much of a linear connection between English um, influence, a British influence by this point in the late 18th and 19th century, with this with this earlier period um, at the end of my presentation. There, so thanks for your comment. Uh, and yeah, the the, the gold um, uh, trade is super important uh, um, um, moving forwards from the 18th century, early 18th century. But what really intrigued me was your your first comment there on the um, the growth in uh, sugar production in the area around uh, Rio at the same time as Barbados is taking off in the 1640s. But the, the Barbados is uh, far more dynamic. And I, I want to uh, press you perhaps or just invite a broader discussion as to, as to why that is. Is that because Barbados has this heavy investment from, from London merchants in, in that decade, which stimulates um, 
uh, the sugar industry through um, purchases of enslaved Africans and uh, the machinery that's needed to really kickstart um, uh, the sugar plantations? Or is it perhaps that there's something to do with the way that in the English are organizing sugar production on Barbados as well, the integrated plantation, which develops in the 1640s and 1650s, and perhaps that's um, a, a more efficient way uh, of uh, organizing sugar production when compared to the more, uh, what Menard and Schwartz, I think, call the more dispersed system in, in Brazil. Um, I open that to the floor, but yeah, no, really interesting comments. Thank you. I think, I think it's mostly the, the English merchant investment. Uh, if, if I remember Manas correctly, he says the integrated sugar production developed in, uh, slowly developed in Barbados and only reached apogee in the late 17th century, early 18th century. Uh, but so you have a, a you have a point that Rio de Janeiro production was smaller than the, was smaller even than Bahia. It had, its sugar plantations had something like 40 slaves, so it was. Pre, uh, the, the sugar plantations were, were were pretty small, but I think the most important factor was the the scale of merchant investment that simply wasn't there here in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, we, here in Rio, uh, I think most of the of the capital for investment was locally generated. So and and the and the second thing was that they had much less access. To slaves, to enslaved persons, because mm -hmm. the Dutch were, were in Angola, and and São Paulo enslavers had much less access to Native American uh, enslaved persons after 1631. So just at the moment, the Rio de Janeiro was trying to fulfill this this growing demand. Uh, it had less capital, and less uh, workers, uh, and less access to workers than Barbados. There's an excellent article on the a comparison by uh, Manard on the Bahia on the Bahia sugar, Bahia sugar production and, and Barbados sugar production. I think it's a 2001 book chapter. I don't remember the, mm -hmm. the exact reference now, but it's it really shows that one difference was also that uh, there was much uh, the, the English system was much more favorable to creditors, while the Brazilian system was much more favorable to debtors. So the, they, they had more incentive to, yeah. to invest in, the, in, the, in sugar production. Well, one, one last thing I forgot to add was these connections shows why Brazil, uh, loser Brazilian agents was very early. They, 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 they paid attention very early to Barbados. The first document I saw uh, cite in Barbados, I think Barbados was 1655. So they were, they were by the, the mid 1650s, they were already worried uh, because they thought Barbados was becoming a major competitor to Brazil. Mm. And why they knew that? Likely because of such English traders that were active in Lisbon, you pointed out. So it's one more piece of the puzzle that, that, uh, that your presentation mm. adds to, to the understanding of this wider picture. Thanks so much, Tio. It's, it's really fascinating, your comments, and I'll, I'll be in touch via email. I'm keen to continue um, this discussion. Thank you. Next, uh, Livia. Thanks, um, thanks, Michael. That was such a fantastic um, paper, such a fantastic presentation. Um, I, I found it really interesting how you connected both contexts uh, well, three of those contexts in ways that we, at least remembering my formation, was so that we don't really connect those dots. Um, so by the end of your presentation, you, you, you briefly mentioned how the wars in the context of the wars of the three kingdoms and the civil wars more particularly were affecting the dynamic of trade and how it prompted these investors to consider diversifying their, their investments in trade and all that. And I was just wondering if you could expand a little bit more as to how the conflicts appear in your sources. Are they mentioned, how are they mentioned and how do they just expand a little bit on how they affect this dynamic? Mm. Yes, yes, sure. It's um, uh, the merchants talk about the, the civil wars um, or the, the late troubles as they're often known all the time in their um, correspondence and particularly um, uh, in that with um, uh, Barbados um, and um, yeah no the the, the civil wars are, are um, yeah super important as this context uh, as you say for um, uh, understanding um, investment 
into um, Barbados. And I, I think that they appear in the context of Barbados in particular in um, printed sources and correspondence. So um, Richard Liggins' True and Exact History, uh, uh, as I mentioned, is one example of uh, royalists um, fleeing uh, to, to Barbados, which is quite a common um, occurrence uh, in the mid to late 1640s. Um, and uh, uh, they, they talk about how Barbados is this kind of um, uh, haven from uh, everything that's that's going on uh, in, in England at the time, and it's and it's treated that way because there's repeated uh, admonitions from the governor of Barbados, from um, uh, uh, others based on the island, that they're going to remain neutral um, in, in the civil wars. They don't want to get involved. And this is quite common. We see this in Virginia. We see this um, Antigua and Bermuda to a certain extent uh, as well. Um, and yeah, I just uh, it, it's it's uh, it's fascinating. I think because it. Uh, emphasizes how Barbados, one of these uh, neutral spaces overseas, which is also uh, involved in um, uh, sugar production uh, and this um, the, the sugar boom uh, is uh, a, a draw for um, merchant investment at the time. And so, yeah, the, the, where it really appears, the civil wars are in these printed sources and correspondence where they're talking about Barbados as this neutral space, which is a, a, a potentially safer prospect uh, for uh, investment. And some of the other uh, aspects I've just um, surmised from tracing merchant careers as well. So just seeing what, what are merchants actually doing in the 1640s? What are they investing in? What are they choosing not to invest in? Um, and, um, uh, and that's how we can see how merchant business preferences are, are, are changing um, uh, over the course of the, of the 40s. Great, thanks. Well, uh, does anyone has any other question? Uh, again, you can do it by raising your hand or uh, typing the question. Uh, Philip uh, Whittington, please. Hi there, thanks for that, Michael, that was great. Um, I guess I've got just two questions. and I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to go soon after asking them. It's gonna be very one of those rude things. But, That's okay. Um, and my dog just started barking. So there's a few things going on. Uh, so <laughs> going to, Back to Tiago's point and what you were just talking about then, actually, I was just thinking um, about have you, the development of the commodities market and also thinking about London and the development of London in, in, in that market in relation to the, the North Sea and the Baltic. Because I think, you know, the work of um, Swedish historians and Dutch historians has shown, and German historians have shown the development of, of sugar as a really important commodity within a whole region rather than mm. simply mm. just in um, England. And I'm, I'm just thinking how that might help in terms of thinking about the ascendancy, the quite rapid ascendancy of the English trade, um, not simply in the Great Caribbean, but in the kind of the Great North Sea sure. back over in Europe. Mm. And my other question, um, Adam Smith has got a book coming out on merchants where he's kind of stressing uh, the collaborative and, and corporate practices of merchants um, as opposed to the state or um, sort of private interest. You mentioned private interest as a, as a main motivation there. So I'm just wondering how that fits in relationship to this idea of collaborative and corporate practices um, um, as, and um, yeah, whether you see them compatible or incompatible as a kind of the way in which um, the merchant community was operating at this time and why it was so successful uh, sort of from the mid 17th century. Mm. Um, so just to address your second question um, first, I'm working quite closely with Edmund at the moment on uh, an article project. So we've been discussing some of these things um, uh, quite quite a lot. Um, I think the one I think again, which is unique um, in a sense to the to the 1640s, is the um, uh, or at least uh, um, becomes particularly pronounced in the 1640s, which is my main area of interest when Barbados really takes off, um, is that corporate charters and corporate um, governance is sort of under attack um, uh, quite quite significantly um, uh, in this period and uh, investment in uh, um, uh, uh, the East India Company, the Levant Company drops off uh, precipitously um, uh, as a result. Um, 
so yeah, what, what interests me about Barbados is that it's um, these private interests at work. And um, although, uh, I mean, these merchants are working in partnership, right? It's not as if collaborative enterprise isn't uh, significant. Um, and there are several um, uh, suggestions uh, in the 1620s and also the late 1650s to form a West India company, um, which uh, uh, are interesting um, uh, in particular, I think, because um, uh, during the mid 1650s, uh, after the failure of the Western design, yes, it takes Jamaica, but there were much bigger aspirations for um, the Western design, which was very much merchants collaborating with the state in this venture. Many of the merchants who were involved in uh, the Barbadian sugar trade um, uh, proposed the formation of a West India company um, in 1658 to 59, Martin Knoll and others. Um, and so what I think we're seeing here is merchants recognizing the limitations of the state to sort of um, uh, uh, fulfill their aspirations for English trade with the Caribbean and conquest of, of Spanish America. Um, but I'm not necessarily um, sure that they perhaps thought that this was a superior form of, um, of uh, uh, trade uh, and organization of commerce when compared to, to private enterprise um, because we're also seeing them operate outside of that in West Africa. I think it's just different contexts work for different methods of organization uh, of commerce in many merchants minds in this period um, and the Caribbean is one where they flirt with the formation of a West India company but it never really um, uh, takes off due to the importance of um, these different private connections and some of these transnational trading connections as well that are going on in, in the Caribbean which is very much a transnational space um, with Sephardic merchants, Dutch merchants and others interacting. I don't know whether you want to come back at that, um, um, Phil. I can see you. No, no, I'm, I'm looking agitatedly at my dog. It's not the okay. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, but, and, and sorry, the first point, um, uh, yeah, uh, uh, about um, sugar uh, uh, trading and um, uh, the North Sea region. Yeah, I, I think it's um, uh, uh, really uh, important and helps perhaps to uh, explain um, um, the rise of London in this period after 1650. I mean, sugar was an important commodity in Antwerp um, and also Brazilian sugar, right? Um, from the, in the 16th century um, and other continental markets were really important. Uh, and what we're seeing after the rise of Barbados, I think is that the, the market share of the control of that really lucrative commodity, sugar and other plantation products as well is, is, is shifting uh, in terms of the entrepot trade to, to London and the development of that re-export trade to the continent uh, is really significant, uh, as you say, in the, in the, in the rise uh, of London as an important port um, city in that North Sea region. And uh, uh, I mean, what, what I didn't really go into here is the role of consumers both in, in uh, England and the continent as well in, in driving these, uh, the, the important um, rise in sugar production in, in the Caribbean, because um, I think there's a really interesting dynamic going on between European consumers and producers in the Caribbean and merchants as intermediaries in that process. But um, that's another talk um, for, for another day, I guess. Um, but, but yeah, thanks, Phil, for your, for your comments and questions. Cheers. Thanks for coming. Uh, while people are still thinking about their questions, I would like to make uh, one, Maya. Um, you mentioned, uh, when you replied uh, Livia's question, uh, you mm -hmm. mentioned print culture, and I was really interesting, interested in that, especially because of the maps and some of the, the engravings mm -hmm. that you showed during the presentation. Uh, I would like to ask you how those encounters between uh, Barbados, Brazil, England, and the, the, the Netherlands were kind of depicted in, in the print culture or if they were mentioned in the English print culture uh, at all. You, I saw the, the quotation of Samuel Hartley, so I imagine that, yeah, that there was a debate. So uh, how could you talk about those, the circulation of those ideas in, in print culture? Hmm. Um, thanks, thanks for your question, Veronica. And um, uh, it's it's going to be a very poor answer on my behalf because um, much to Mike's um, chagrin over the course of my PhD career, I didn't really uh, engage too much with print culture in my um, uh, study of Barbados, and that's something that I'm really trying to redress as I move towards publishing this as a as a monograph and as articles um, in the future. Um, but I, I think that the encounters um, and the description of uh, Barbados is um, and Brazil is super significant in changing um, uh, 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 
English European understandings of uh, of what's going on uh, in the Caribbean and, and Ligon's true and exact history from 1657. Uh, if you haven't checked it out uh, already, is is a really fascinating example of this. Ligon's book um, uh, sort of is is many different things at once. It's both a, 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 a practical manual on how to speculate in sugar production but it's also a very early example of English travel literature where all sorts of aspects of the Caribbean, um, uh, the island in, uh, in particular, its flora, its fauna are being described for uh, an English uh, audience uh, and that's um, uh, really shapes uh, future uh, print culture discussions about um, Barbados and the Caribbean um, moving forwards as well and we see um, a uh, lots of other publications, often in French and Dutch, actually, um, more than English, um, moving forwards in the 1660s and 70s. Um, but but yeah, that that um, that um, true and exact history of Barbados is a really important one. But I need to get into, for example, the Thomas and Tracks and other things like that to really see how Barbados is is being uh, d discussed there, because I know it is being discussed. I've I've seen some of those um, uh, quotes, but I really need to go through systematically um, uh, and see. Um, uh, uh, how it's being um, presented, portrayed, uh, etc. Um, because I just haven't done that research yet. But thank you for the uh, timely reminder that I need to do it. <laughs> yeah, and I, I imagine that it, it could be really interesting because um, at least when we think about Brazil and the uh, Iberian world, we have like lots of discussion on uh, especially the, the slave trade and how slaves were employed in the production of all of this mm -hmm. uh, products, so maybe uh, there was something uh, alike in the, mm -hmm. the English print trade. So it could be very interesting to compare, maybe, and, and understand how they sure, sure. discuss this. I think what I've seen, they're really concerned about in the 1640s in um, print culture and um, Barbados is royalist newspapers, um, sort of accusing parliamentarians of shipping. Uh, indentured servants and capturing people and uh, sending them off to, to Barbados, etc. So it's it's sort of Barbados really figures in the mind of um, of people in England at this time as uh, somewhere you really don't want to go. It's a death sentence to go over there as a white indentured servant, as a prisoner of war, uh, etc. And um, uh, the sort of term Barbados uh, became uh, quite um, common as a verb sort of to, to send someone uh, overseas to either their, their death or beyond the seas to um, uh, a very unfortunate place. So it's sort of that's how it um, figures um, in the mind of a lot of people in England, a place of death, but also a place of wealth and opulence, um, um, but also depravity as well. Um, so yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's very interesting. Thank you. Uh, well, next we have Mabel Winter. Hi, nice, uh, very nice talk, Michael. Well done. Um, I was just really interested in um, sort of following on from Phil's question, really. I'm really interested in the concept of sort of partnership recently mm -hmm. um, as a form of association that I think is, is really important, but probably not much is known about. Um, and I was just interested about you mentioning that they sort of did propose a company um, but mm. was this sort of officially proposed and rejected by the state, or was it that it didn't get enough backing from the merchants themselves? Sure, and, sure. And, then, sorry, and then also a little related uh, question, sort of with those merchant partnerships, is there any evidence of them left behind? Um, you know, are they merchant plans of partnerships? Have they got any mm. documents left behind? And do the merchants themselves actually ever talk about the, sort of, the benefits of those um, well, I'll address your first question first. Um, uh, and thank you, Mabel, for those uh, questions. So um, what happened with the West India Company proposed in the late 1650s is that it didn't take off because the restoration intervened. So these merchants are talking with uh, um, sort of Richard Cromwell and others and uh, um, trying to get this thing off the road because they're, they're quite close. Um, some of the guys that I'm uh, uh, involved in Barbados, Povey, Noel, um, Thompson and others with uh, the uh, uh, protectorate and then the Commonwealth regime as well. Um, so they're using those ties to try and think, well, look, we, we want to propose this company. Here are the reasons why it's good. The, the proposal exists in manuscript form, not in printed form uh, at the British Library. Um, but uh, uh, 
I do think it's proposed through back channels, um, not not um, perhaps not officially, but that's how a lot of things I think work between interaction between merchants and the state is through back channels, personal influence, etc. Particularly in the 1640s and 50s, um, but the restoration intervenes, um, and after that, the Royal African Companies formed, um, which uh, uh, is heavily involved uh, in the sugar and, and uh, uh, the slave and, and Play trade and then sugar coming back. Um, so um, that's where um, investment and attention is, is focused on, I think. Um, and yeah, it's just one of those, again, contingencies that the restoration hadn't have happened. We may have seen um, a West India company formed um, to consolidate the control of these key merchants in London, the stranglehold over Barbadian trade, because planters on Barbados itself were petrified of, of this um, um, uh, uh, happening because they in enjoyed uh, free trade with the Dutch, with London merchants as well. Yes, they, and this sort of gets into your other question here, they had these partnerships um, with London merchants, very important in terms of credit networks, investment, etc. But they also like to have their bit of trade on the side with the Dutch and the French and others as well. So they like to have um, um, that option too. So that's why we see such vociferous opposition to any proposal for a West India company, the Navigation Acts on Barbados itself because, because of this. Um, so could you just remind me of your second question as well? It's about partnership and whether it's beneficial, right? Yeah, and just whether there's any sort of remnants of people talking about these partnerships and actually discussing the benefits of them and how they were set up and, and why. So I don't think I have come up, uh, come across of much talking about um, whether they think it's beneficial. It's just sort of exists in the record, right? This is how these commercial networks work. And that's probably because a lot of what I'm dealing with is rather boring stuff like deeds, mortgages, um, court cases showing the evidence of trade going on, etc. The, there is some correspondence, but perhaps not as much as you uh, as I would have wanted to, to, to show how these merchant networks are actually um, functioning um, and how these partnerships are developing. So um, no, unfortunately not. But if I now I know you're interested in it. If I do come up with anything as I'm researching, I'll, I'll send it your way. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. But yeah, they're mostly they're mostly merchant planter relationships and merchant London, London merchant and Barbadian merchant uh, relationships as well that are, that are functioning here. Yeah, thank you. Cheers. Uh, any other questions? I guess we have time for uh, a couple of other questions. Uh, Michael Bredek, please. Thank, thanks very much, Michael. I, I um, wanted to ask you to speak about some of your other work, actually, if, we, if that's okay with everyone else. So just the next stage of the story, I know you've got very interesting things to say about where the capital goes next, mm. both within a British slave economy and a commodity economy, but also back into, I know you've been doing research for some of, you know, in the backwash of Black Lives Matter, some of the, mm. found, the foundations of some pretty powerful British institutions. So ju uh, it's really just uh, giving you an opportunity to, to tell a mm. bit more of this fascinating story, if you, mm. if you don't mind. Sure, yeah, yeah. No, so um, I've um, been finding some really interesting things out actually about, um, yeah, because as Mike says, my um, PhD works really about where the money comes from going into Barbados and exploring the origins of that. But what I'm really doing in my postdoctoral work is thinking through um, where it's going afterwards. It's, it's Barbados is this um, wealth generating island that's um, uh, uh, um, super significant in this period and we're, we're seeing wealth generated there being reinvested in all sorts of uh, different outlets and um, a lot of what I've been doing at the moment is to think not necessarily about where this money's going in terms of overseas trade we see it being invested Barbadian capital in the East India Company and particularly in 1657 there's a huge injection of Barbadian capital into the EIC um, in 1657 which has a real tangible impact I argue on um, what's uh, uh, the, the development of the company in the next sort of 10, 15 years, because we see it take a real um, interest in Atlantic affairs um, in West Africa um, and elsewhere. Uh, but my real focus is on the English economy and what's going on uh, there and English society as well, I guess. So um, we're seeing capital from Barbados being invested in particular um, into philanthropic institutions and enterprises, which is something that um, uh, has been interesting me and some of my work recently. We're seeing um, 
petty schools in Chesterfield, which is just down the road, being um, financed and set up by merchants like Gilbert Heathcote, who um, uh, is a prominent London sugar trader, slave trader uh, in the uh, late 17th century, making his money in the Caribbean and the West African slave trade and um, uh, in, in his will, reinvesting money in the development of uh, English uh, educational institutions in in hospitals, charity hospitals in um, in central London, Guys and St Thomas's Hospital in particular. Um, I have a, a report on the links between Guys and St Thomas's Hospital and the Caribbean uh, slave economy in the 17th and early 18th century. That's going to be published next month, um, co-authored with a colleague Esther Brott, um, which shows how um, the the sugar and, and slave trades uh, were really important uh, in financing the, the the redevelopment and the foundation of um, St Thomas's Hospital in the 1690s and Guys Hospital in the uh, 17 early 1720s, um, and. Uh, um, yeah, other other institutions as well. I've, I've, I haven't started this work yet, but um, uh, I'm going to be doing some work over the next year with uh, the Bank of England too, and tracing their links to um, the the sugar uh, slave economy, which are a myriad over the uh, period of the foundation of the bank in the late 17th century through to the um, uh, um, late 19th century when. Um, uh, slavery is abolished in uh, uh, Brazil in 1888, because that's really where we have to end the story of English and British involvement in the slave economy. It doesn't end in, 18, in the 1830s. British businessmen have their tentacles, um, their financial links in the slave economy of elsewhere, the USA, Brazil, well beyond um, the, the 1830s. So we have to think about that too. Um, uh, so yeah, just, just thinking through where this money is being sent uh, reinvested in England, philanthropic enterprises, financial institutions, uh, overseas trade, um, uh, English land too. I haven't gone into that, but there's been some excellent work done on that by um, uh, historians like Madge Dresser and the National Trust and English Heritage in, in recent um, uh, months and years. Um, uh, so yeah, just the, the significant impact that Barbados and uh, elsewhere in the Caribbean played in the development of um, English society really. Um, in the 17th century. It's this uh, reciprocal relationship, as I see it, between the Caribbean and early modern England um, in this period. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Uh, considering the time, uh, unfortunately, I'll have to end this session, but it was really brilliant. And I guess that everybody enjoyed and the discussion. So thank you, Michael, once again, for accepting our invitation and for giving such a fascinating talk. I would also like to invite everyone to uh, our next session in two weeks, uh, 6th July. We will receive uh, Dr. Marina Garone Gravier from the University of uh, Mexico. She will talk about women and the print trade in early modern Mexico. So uh, I guess that everyone might be interested. Her talk will be in Spanish, but we will provide uh, a kind of English translation to everyone that is interested in coming. So please, you're all invited. So thank you once again for uh, attending and see you next week. Thanks so much for coming, everyone. <laughs>